Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, it's industry story time again, but this time it's mixed with a, a bit of uh, theory and circuit design. This time around, it's about uh, crystal oscillator stability and drift over time, and I think you might find it rather interesting. Quite a few years ago now, I was working on some ocean bottom seismic recording equipment. Now, what this is, they're actually uh, these autonomous units, battery powered. They're, you know, several feet long and they have a huge battery pack and they have a little data logger and recorder and they've got a hydrophone and which measures um, basically hydrophones and underwater microphone and they've got an XYZ uh, tilt sensor as well. And basically what they do is they you drop them down in, into the deep ocean and they sit on the ocean floor and they measure um, they measure the, the uh, seismic activity um, uh, that actually happens from a boat. Now this is how it actually works um, out in the field, right? Here's the ocean up here, okay? You've got a survey, a seismic survey vessel up the top and it's got one of these acoustic um, pingers on it, a big, a huge uh, noise source which generates these big bangs, these impulses, which travel down to the ocean floor down here. Now, if this is the ocean floor, these autonomous recording units, they actually spread, you don't just use one. What you do is you spread them out, you know, 50 meters apart, 100 meters apart, something like that, across the ocean floor like this. And you would put down a whole bunch of them, dozens, hundreds, that actually sit down on the ocean floor and they'd stay there continuously recording for um, up to several months. And they would sample um, the, the hydrophone just waiting for these acoustic ping signals that actually um, travel through the ocean floor and then reflect back up. And you can actually determine um, oil, where find where oil is and things like that. And it's quite fascinating. You've got these um, underwater robotic vehicles which will actually take them down and they'll deploy them in certain locations. They'll know the location of each one and then after a couple of months, um, well, uh, during the couple of months, the boat will, you know, uh, troll around the ocean going bang, 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 generating all these noise sources which are picked up by the, all these autonomous ocean bottom recorders. And after a couple of months, before the batteries run out, they send the rover back down, they pick up these units, bring them back on deck and they, um, they synchronize them and they suck the data out of them. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Now the trick with these sort of uh, ocean bottom recording systems is that uh, the recording has to be synchronous across all these units. But they're autonomous. They can't, they can't talk to each other and they run from their own independent free running clock oscillators. So what these things need are really accurate internal oscillators cal calibrated to uh, GPS time when, when you deploy them and then they run on their own internal free running oscillator, each one of them. Now, um, they, it's very important that they all sample at the same time. They sample at a sample rate of anywhere from a couple of hundred hertz up to several kilohertz and this is continuous for several months. Now, um, over that time, the internal clocks inside these units can drift and that causes, they can either drift up in frequency, down in frequency, whatever, due to the tolerance, the stability of the crystal oscillator in them. Now, this can become really problematic when you try and post-analyze the data, um, because if the samples are, if, if you've got several channels like this, okay, and then you've got sample points here, and this one's here, and this one's over here, and this one's over here. They're all supposed to line up perfectly like that, but you don't. When the oscillators drift, you end up getting, um, you know, they, they can be all over the place like that. And there's a maximum, um, there's all complex math and theory, theory involved, but um, really, uh, you can only tolerate a certain amount of this um, drift or instability in, in any one of these oscillators over time before the data becomes essentially useless. Now you can try and correct for this uh, drift as I'll explain, but um, really it's important to get as low a um, drift in all these um, oscillators as possible over the several months that they sit 
on the ocean floor. Now with these ocean bottom recorders, there's a big trade-off between battery life and the stability of the oscillator. You can't just whack in a super duper precision oscillator if, you know, some, some rubidium oscillator or something like that because it chews too much power. These things have to sit on the ocean bottom for a couple of months. And the data, massive amount of data over that time, so it's got to be stored on hard drives at the time. You could probably do it on solid state drives these days, which draw a bit less power, but still very power hungry things to actually store all this data and, and I have a high precision oscillator. So let's look at several oscillator technologies. We've basically got the standard crystal oscillator XO. Now they typically have a typical accuracy, stability, you know, I won't go into the difference between stability and drift and age and all that sort of stuff. Um, because that just makes it too complicated, but they're basically um, what's called 10 ppm, um, parts per million. That is the traditional measure of the stability and accuracy of an oscillator. And that can also be written as 10 to the minus 5, because as you can see, 1 ppm is 10 to the minus 6. 1 part per million, 10 to the minus 6 is a 1 millionth. So, um, so that's how it is. Now, the next type is, um, and then, you know, you might use these, um, a standard crystal oscillator, you've seen them, you use them when you, to power your picker, your Atmel Micro or something else. So they're, they're not very accurate at all. Um, now the next type is the temperature controlled crystal oscillator, TCXO. That's what it stands for. And they're a bit better. They can, they're roughly in the order of 1 ppm or 10 to the minus 6. Now, the next type, but that's still not good enough, if you do the math, it's still not good enough for these ocean bottom survey things. We need something better. We need something in the order of 10 to the minus 8 for our ocean bottom application. Now, the next type of um, device is the digital temperature compensated crystal oscillator or digitally temperature controlled crystal oscillator. And they, they're in the order of 0.1 to 0.01 ppm. 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 8. Aha! That's what's, um, that is suitable for our ocean bottom, or it should be, roughly, but we'll go into that later. The next type is the traditional, they've been around for a long time, these ones, the oven controlled crystal oscillator. And they're, they're basically the same as the DTCXO, which is a more modern technology. They're 0.1 to 0.01. PPM, and then you've got rubidium oscillators, which are becoming more like a primary um, atomic standard. They're, you know, they're much better than um, 10 to the minus 9 or 0.001 ppm, one part per billion, actually. Um, but these are rubidium oscillator. Not only are they quite um, uh, fragile, uh, but they're actually they consume, you know, tens of watts, huge amount of power. We couldn't even afford that sort of power. Now the oven controlled oscillator, they're typically um, 1 to 5 watts or something like that. That's how much power they use. That was too much for us. This thing's got to last for three months on the ocean floor. So we use this new technology, DTCXO. It had, uh, the one we actually used had uh, 0.03 um, ppm was its basic um, stability and that was fairly close to what we wanted. Now a DTCXO is a is a fairly uh, complex bit of thing, and they're actually quite expensive. It's got a built-in microcontroller, and um, what it does is that um, they're individually calibrated at all temperature points over the entire range. They're stored in the micro, and then the micro actually adjusts the frequency of the oscillator based on the current temperature, and it basically takes out, um, it basically flattens out the temperature characteristic curve of the actual crystal used in there. And, um, and they do actually work quite well. The technology is quite good. Now here's where the story comes in. We weren't quite sure, even the manufacturer couldn't tell us the actual uh, long-term drift characteristics of a digitally temperature controlled crystal oscillator or any oscillator for that matter. It's quite hard information to actually get, um, let alone measure. So we thought we'd, um, we had to come up with a way to actually measure the drift over time of one of these oscillators to actually see if it was good enough for our application and if it wasn't, could we correct for it in post-processing software. Now, when you're looking at the drift 
of an oscillator or its change in its absolute frequency over time, uh, you basically have to compare it against something. You need a reference. Um, so let's just assume we've got a perfect reference. Now, um, if you have, if you plot the um, the drift characteristics or the or the aging characteristics or anything of a of a uh, crystal oscillator, you will get and a perfect one. You would get a flat line over time. Time is you know hours, days, weeks, whatever. It'll have zero drift over time. But they you know that's you can't get a perfect oscillator like that, a perfect crystal. So what you're going to get is you're going to get some sort of drift over time like this. Now, it can actually be in either direction because you don't actually know which direction it's going to be, but let's just say it's in the positive direction like this. Now, it would be ideal if this drift over time was completely linear. It was straight like this because then what you can do is you can actually, um, when you start your uh, data logging, you can um, get a real accurate time date stamp at the start of it using a precision rubidium, GPS lock rubidium standard, you know, orders of magnitude better than the oscillator you're actually using, right? You calibrate it at the start and then when you get it back, you actually um, calibrate it at the end and you flatten it out, okay? You calculate the difference between the, um, the true time that um, you get from your precision reference against the recorded time and you basically uh, can offset that. You know how far it's drifted. If it's drifted, you know, 20 seconds over the order of two days or something like that, you can actually correct it, which has the, um, which uh, will actually have the process of flattening this curve out. It brings it down here. So this curve drift, you can actually correct it and make it flat like that, perfectly flat. And that's ideal. But a crystal oscillator is never actually flat like that over time. And we're not talking about temperature variation here either. Even at a perfectly fixed temperature that does not vary over days, weeks and months, the oscillator will not drift linear like that. It'll actually have um, a typical characteristic which will be like that. Or it could be like that. Or it, it can even reverse itself sometimes and go like that, but it typically has a sort of a, um, a you know a quarter sinusoidal or a half sinusoidal um, envelope to it. Now, um, so when you do your correction at the end, as I said, when you do your, well, it's often called a, a, a skew correction or a time correction, you end up with not that straight curve, but you end up with this curve down here like this. So you don't know what your data has done during, you know, five days ago or something like that. So it's um, really, that's a real problem. So we had to measure what this maximum drift over time was at a fixed frequency. So that's what we did. Now measuring clock drift over time is actually quite an obscure measurement. Hardly anyone ever needs to do it. Um, especially when you have to compensate it at the start and the end and then correct for this drift over time, it's something quite specific to the um, to the uh, seismic industries which I was working in. There's probably a few other industries where it matters as well, but um, it's, it's quite a specific problem. And you can't just buy a bit of equipment, even from a company like Agilent who make gear for everything. You can't just walk in and buy a bit of kit, stick your oscillator on it, and it tells you the drift, it tells you the maximum drift over time. It just, you know, you can't really get such a thing. So uh, we decided to actually um, to make our own. We really had no choice. And so this is the idea I came up with for measuring clock drift. Now there's probably more than one way to skin a cat here, but this is the idea I came up with for measuring clock drift. And this is how we did it, okay? We basically had a rubidium standard reference oscillator, and this was like, as I said, you know, 10 to the power of minus 11 or something like that, super accurate. For all practical purposes, it can be considered an absolute um, frequency reference and that normally is available at 10 megahertz but we divided it down to an 8 kilohertz signal for reasons of well for several technical reasons but um, uh, which I won't really go into because it's not worth it now um, the we our DTCXO we were trying to measure here 
um, we actually divided that down to 96 kilohertz. Once again, for technical reasons that um, aren't really important. Now, what we're trying to do here is measure, okay, this is an absolute reference, okay? Now, the 96 kilohertz signal we're trying to measure will drift with time, back and forth. It's not, it doesn't just go in one direction, it can drift back and forth. So these clock edges, when you first start them, when you first calibrate them, they're spot on. But it will slowly just drift with time in either direction. And we need to measure that. So how do you do it? So what you do is you actually have a sample clock, a high frequency sample clock going continuously like this and you count the number of pulses between this start point, okay, you use your, you use your uh, frequency reference, the rising edge of that as a start point for a counter here and then you count the number of pulses until the first rising edge of the signal you're trying to measure and then at the end of it you will have X number of counts, you might have say you know 30 counts or something like that to actually um, measure that the difference between that edge and that edge. Now that gives you the difference in time but you need to track that how it's trending, how it's drifting, how this signal is drifting back or forth compared to this signal. So what you do is you actually um, divide this entire cycle here, okay, into four, well, I chose to do it into four quadrants like this, A, B, C, and D. Now, where this counter um, finished, 30 will put it in quadrant A, like that. But then you, then you would sample again at, at this point here, but then you'd start the process again at the next um, uh, cycle of your reference clock. And you would, you would see it in this first case, it might be 30 counts, and then it might be the next one, it might be 50 counts. And you know it's moved from, uh, from a quadrant A to quadrant B. So you, you can actually see it drifting in that direction. And likewise, if the count, if the next one goes back down to 30, you know it's drifted back in the other direction. Now, because there's, there's going to be jitter here, okay, the, the actual signal you're trying to measure could jitter back and forth. And you don't want those to count as part of the drift. You only want to see it move in one direction or the next. So what you do is you ignore anything that any counts which go between two quadrants like this and you only count when it goes when it travels from one quadrant through another quadrant to the next one and then if it did that if you see it drift between three quadrants you would increment a um, count an up or a down count you would increment that by one if it's going in this direction and then if it's going the opposite direction you would um, you would actually um, get plus one for the down count. It's going in the opposite direction. So, and then you time stamp all of these things. You time stamp every time you get one of these pulses. And then you can actually count. You log these on a PC over the hours, days, and months. And bingo, you can actually see it drift in comparison to your reference. And you know exactly which direction it's going and at what time and how fast. And then you can actually get a plot. So here's how you implement that as a basic circuit. This is how I did it. You got your 10 megahertz rubidium reference coming in here. You divide it down, in this case to eight kilohertz, which goes into the enable of a counter, a binary counter. And the signal you're trying to measure, 96 kilohertz, goes into a latch flip-flop, which then resets the counter. And the counter is clocked from the 10 megahertz reference. So what that gives you is what we saw on the previous thing. You've got your 8 kilohertz reference like this and then your 96 kilohertz and your counter uh, accounts between the clock edges of the two signals and then it repeats and then you have a microcontroller here which just reads when it's finished the count and then it determines whether or not this 96 kilohertz signal is drifted in that direction or is drifted in that direction or is just stayed still and if it's drifted a certain amount in one direction it'll increment the fast it'll give an output on this fast 
um, it'll give a pulse on this fast output. If it's drifted in the slow direction, it'll give an output on the slow pulse. And if it's drifting too fast, i.e. it goes through more than two of those quadrants at once, well, that indicates there's something grossly wrong and it gives you an error pulse as well. So you know if it's, you know, something's gone completely screwy with your measurements. And then you just have a data logger, PC, which sits there and timestamps these signals coming out and bingo, you can get a, uh, a graph of drift over time. Magic. So what did we see when we actually measured a bunch of these um, oscillators over the span of days and weeks and even a month? Um, uh, how much drift did we actually see and what did the characteristic look like? Well, it's exactly what we expected basically. Well, we actually didn't know what to expect at the start of this, but we knew with um, further research, we actually knew that this is a typical characteristic of what to expect. We actually found that it, you know, it had, it had, it had actually jumped back and forth. It's not smooth. It'd have characteristic, and it'd jump around like this, and it might go down like that, and another one might go, you know, drift like this, and another one might go in this direction like this, and another might go like that maybe and this would be over the span of you know days or weeks or even a, a month and two months is the longest recording period we actually did and this was at constant temperature and of course this result is actually um skew corrected we've actually corrected the slope of that um we've actually uh corrected the time as i mentioned before and you still get this characteristic drift over time and that's what this is all about. Crystal oscillators are not stable with time. And we're not just talking temperature variations. These variations are due, they're actually inherent in the quartz crystal itself. And as you also see in probably another blog I'm gonna do on this, is that this characteristic can also reset itself and change based on uh, vibration and shock of the quartz crystal itself, which is another interesting characteristic. And basically, we realize that they all sort of fit a this generic sort of, um, you know, half sinusoidal envelope. So we were actually able to come up with a, based on a whole bunch of empirical measured data, we we're able to come up with a, um, a, a formula for our maximum drift over time. And we found that it was, you know, it was within basically what the customer could tolerate. So we found that we were actually capable of post-processing this signal, correcting it, and, and bingo, and then uh, getting the data we needed. So that's how we got away with using these cheap and, um, and very low power, which was the key for us, DT CXO modules in our ocean bottom seismic survey gear. They drifted, but because we did all this uh, empirical measurements and came up with a curve fit formula and came up with techniques to actually correct the data when they were resynchronized when they came up on the boat, we found that the um, error was with inside the customer's required tolerance and they could use our system and everyone was happy. So it worked out really well. And it's a rather interesting uh, thing which most people will never get to deal with. Clock drift and clock drift correction. And, well, it's just something you might need to be aware of one day. Quartz crystal oscillators drift, and they can drift outside of temperature. They can drift just due to their inherent characteristics of the crystal itself. All sorts of factors are involved. I won't go into the physics of it. It's, it's very deep to actually try and understand it. And shock and vibration and all sorts of other things. So, crystals aren't as simple as they appear.